It's Nolan. What's going on, beautiful people? It's the kid Jay Nolan here. Welcome back to another episode of Inside the Industry, your number one source for music, entertainment, commentary, and breakdowns. Got a good show set up for y'all today. Of course, we're going to get into Megan The Stallion's interview on Club Shay Shay with Shannon Sharp. We definitely got to get into it. It's one of the biggest interviews, one of the biggest trending topics in the music game right now. Great conversation. Salute to uh, Shannon Sharp for putting out another, another good interview. Uh, we're going to get into, of course, the back and forth situation between Deb Antney and Nicki Minaj. And on the heels of it, Nikki is hinting at a possible hiatus. We're going to get into Lil Mama coming out and saying some dis disrespectful things towards Nicki Minaj, which I personally felt were a bit, uh, it's a bit heavy handed. Very, very, uh, it's a little too much for me. You know what I'm saying? Um, we're going to talk about that. We're going to get into Cardi B teasing and previewing some new music. <laughs> you know? A lot of people keep saying she's pump fake and she ain't got nothing in the tuck. We shall see. Okay. Gonna play the sample that she that she put up too. Uh, hopefully we don't get flagged for it. It's very short. We're gonna get into that. Um, let me see if there's anything else of note that we're gonna be covering in this particular episode. I do believe that's pretty much the size of it at this time. But we'll see where we'll see where things take us. All right. Now, first things first, as stated, we got to get into this interview with Megan Thee Stallion and um, Shannon Sharp, right? As we all know, Megan just released the Megan album. There's been a lot of talk about it, positive and negative. You know what I mean? Um, as of right now, according to Hits Daily Double, the album is ranked at number three on the Billboard charts. Um, so, you know, ahead of her is Taylor Swift and Morgan Whalen. I think that's being overlooked. She sold about 65,000 copies independently, might I add, uh, 18,000 of which are, um, actual album purchases. The rest are due to streams, right? And remember, Megan album is released via Hot Girl Productions, which is her own independent company that she owns in distribution with WMG, which is Warner Music Group. So she owns this music. She's effectively an independent artist, but she has distribution from Warner. Right. So this is all on her legwork, her and her team. Rock Nation, you know, they helped her put put some plays together. They help promote. They help, you know, um, get her partnerships, brand deals and stuff like that. But the brunt of all of this is on her and she put the money into the project and she's going to win big. Some people may say 65,000 sales isn't all that great. She's out selling. She's this project outsold the first week for Traumazine, which a lot of people liked. I wasn't a fan of that album, but I believe Traumazine did close to 50,000 the first week. So she actually exceeded her previous project, which was done with two labels in pocket, which was uh, 300 um, and actually three labels, if we've been specific, because there was 1501. Right. That's who originally signed her. They went and did a uh, partnership deal. Really kind of like a um, first right of refusal deal with 300. And then 300 upstreamed her to Warner. So with three labels in pocket, she sold 50. She does it by herself. She's at 65,000. So keep that in mind. Plus the profit is actually hers, meaning she's going to get paid off of this music. Whereas many artists in the music industry, regardless of what they sell, they don't see none of the um, profits from their streams and sales. We just got to speak about this. Honestly, there's going to be some people out there that say I'm capping on Megan Thee Stallion, I would challenge you to go do the research yourself to learn about the business if you want to speak on it. Because if you're not going to put the legwork to understand what it is that we're talking about, you might not want to speak at all. OK, that's all I'm going to say on that. Now, let's get into the interview. There's a few segments that I do want to pull up. Um, number one, I want to pull up Shannon Sharp's apology that he issued to Megan Thee Stallion. And, you know, I don't even know if 
Megan needed an apology based on the comments, but he did anyway. You know what I mean? Because he had a conversation a while back with uh, Chad Ochocinco where he said something to the effect of if he had the opportunity, he would have Megan split like a quarter to three or something like that. You know, legs wide open type thing. Saying if he ever got the chance, he would like to smash. I don't think she took too too um, adversely to that. I think a lot of men lust after her. But trying to be a class act. Shannon Sharp said, I want to go ahead and get this out the way in the beginning of the interview. So salute to him on that for being a stand-up person. Here we go. Meg, before we go any uh, further... I want to apologize to you personally. And I didn't, you know, I always wanted to sit down and have a conversation with you. I didn't know if that was going to be possible, possible, but I was always hoping that I got an opportunity to bump into you because I made a comment. I think it was like September, October, and I told a joke and it was, I said it in jest, but I believe the joke would have been just as funny had I left you out of it. So for any unwanted attention, harm, shame, embarrassment that I caused you or your family, I want to say, as a man, as I sit here before you, I apologize. I appreciate that. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Norm, when every, anytime someone comes on the show, we have to toast because you have an amazing, you, you, you've been amazing and you have an amazing career going forward. So this is my personal cognac, Shea by Laportier. Okay. So Shea by Laportier? That's what it's called, Shea by Laportier. Let me know what you, hey. You know, okay, because you know I'm the cognac queen. <laughs> okay, okay, cognac. I don't know if you okay, you, okay, you you, you knows it. This mm-hmm. is what they call it's called nosing. You saw me. Okay. <laughs> Not the, hold on. Just, just. Okay. I was waiting on it to really like sting me. Ah, uh, uh, see, it's, just, it's smooth, ain't it? It's smooth. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I was waiting on it to tear me up. No, 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 no. We don't do that. Okay. Well, thank I like you. that. <laughs> well, we, you know what? We're going to send you send you away with a bottle with your very own. Thank you. All right. So that was the intro. And again, we're going to play clips. Going to play clips. We're not pulling it up. We're just going to play audio clips of what was going down. All right. So that was the intro to the interview. He apologized, you know, in case she got any unwanted attention. If there was any, you know, backlash or any, you know what I'm saying, hard feelings on her end based on his comments. He wanted to get it out the way and let it be known you know, love and respect. They took a toast of his, uh, his liquor. You know what I mean? His cognac. She fucked with it. She co-signed it. He said he gonna send her away with her own bottle. All right, cool. So within this conversation, they did speak about a number of things, but in this video, I'm only going to hone in on a couple. You could go pull up the interview if you'd like. I thought it was really good. Um, you know, they talked about uh, her connection to Beyonce, Jay-Z, going to uh, Rock Nation, advice that she received from Beyonce, Jay-Z. They talked about uh, artists that she would love to to work with. What's it like going out on her first official arena tour? Some of the some of the discourse around that. Um, if she had any expectations, they talked about the album, some of the features, hidden features, all of that stuff. Again, it was a really dope conversation. The video as of right now of my recording has 1.2 million views in a day on YouTube. It's number one trending on YouTube. So if anybody feels like she's not buzzing, anybody feels like she's not bringing in any sort of uh, traction or attention, you'd be sorely mistaken. Okay. Um. Let me go to my saved clips here to get into some things. So, again, one of the things that was addressed in this interview was linking with Jay-Z. And I do want to talk about that. Moreover, meeting, um, you know, getting advice and understanding Rock Nation, um, that they fuck with her, that they were going to put her on the path to success and get her out of the situation that she was in. As I stated, she was with 1501, which was a management group functioning as a label that signed her to a label that ended up signing her to another label. You know, keep that in mind, the type of situation she was in, which is why they said she was in an unconscionable contract. She wasn't receiving enough royalties. So here... She gets into the relationship with J and B. All right. So let's 
go into that. So obviously Hove, you know, normally, you know, especially in occasion like this. So what was it like to meet Hove? Because I've met him a couple of times. I met him at the Rock Nation office when I first got signed to Rock. Okay. And I was in the room and we just looking at stuff on the projector or whatever, like talking about what I was about to do. And Jay-Z just walked in like it wasn't nothing. And I'm like, y'all got me so fucked up. Like, Jay-Z up in my business? What's going on? Y'all care about me at Rock Nation? Yeah. I was like, okay, here we go. I'm really finna do some shit now. Right. We got Jay-Z up in here, man. Did you make it a stallion? Stop right. playing with me. So how was your conversation? When you talked to Jay, obviously you were at Rock Nation. So what, what was those conversation like? It just felt like I was in the right spot. Mm -hmm. Like, like I said, I was manifesting a lot of stuff in myself. Never did I ever think that I was actually going to be managed by the people that I looked up to. Mm -hmm. um, it just felt like a big family. They, they're just so intelligent. Like they've been through everything. They still going through it right now, mm -hmm. but they, they just know how to carry it. And I'm learning from the best. I feel like I'm in the right spot. I'm in the right position. I ain't never felt so like safe in a situation where I feel like these people got my back. And I just see how much they grind and how much they hustle and how much they let all the talk and whatever else people yeah. gotta say just roll off their back. I'll call Jay or Des. Des is the the woman who really mm -hmm. run shit at Rock Nation. Right. And I'll be like, they see it. Yeah, I know Desi, Desi name be hot out here in the streets, man. I just gotta throw that out there. And it's about me. They got me fucked up now. And they'll be somewhere on the island like, why you even care about that? Are you tripping? Like, <laughs> I'll be like, why the fuck is y'all so cool all the time? When you decided to go independent, did you talk to Jay? Because he's someone that that the business augment is there. B, she knows what to do. So who did you, do? when you decided to say, you know what? I'm going to do this on my own. Did you just, did you talk to them or did you talk to when someone that you trust? When I was in trust? the situation that I was in and I wanted to get out of it, right. they told me you need to do this on your own. Like you you already know what it is. You got all the tools, all the legal shit that you're going through right now. I know you're learning something. Right. So you should be able to figure out how to get out here and be your own boss. Right. Beyonce is the person who actually inspired me to get my own tequila. Wow. Because I used to... I used to be the cognac queen. I'm still the cognac queen. Yeah. But as much as I used to, you know, enjoy cognac and I promoted a lot of people like liquor brands, she was like, the next time I see you, you need to have your own. Right. You need to have your own alcohol, alcoholic beverage. Right. And I was like, you know what? You're right, queen. I am going to have my own shit. So mm. now I have my own tequila. It's called right. Chica Steve Ortiz's. And it's going to be so cute. I've been serving it throughout my tour. Right. And everybody's been loving it. So they, I feel like they definitely put me in a position to learn how to be my own boss. I like that. You know, number one, she talks about feeling safe at Rock Nation. She talks about how they, you know, treat her, how they um, advocate on her behalf, which if you look around, if you look around over the course of the last couple of years, I don't think there's an artist in hip hop that's had more endorsements and brand partnerships than Megan Thee Stallion. We talking about hot girl sauce at Popeye's. Uh, we talking about the new shit with the Prime Day that she just did with Amazon Prime. We're talking about uh, being in fucking She-Hulk acting. Um, didn't she have another uh, ad ad going out at the same time as the fucking uh, hot girl sauce with Popeyes? I think it was another big company she was she had an advertisement out with. Um, thought shit was used in all types of um, advertisements, like. She was out here popping. She been out here popping. You know what I mean? And it didn't really pop like that until she got with Rock Nation. Furthermore, in the interview, she even talks about how her situation with 1501 really inspired her to go independent because um, being that they were at odds, she was going through so much red tape to do anything with her music. She was not able to perform when she would have liked. So to be honest, she probably could have put together this tour, this Hot Girl Summer tour, probably would have been put into effect a year or two sooner had everything gone the right way, had everything gone smoothly. Like she was doing tour, like spot dates, but she wasn't on a complete tour, right? Because 
they were not signing off and allowing her to play the music in the venues because that's a whole nother thing. Uh, when you play an artist's music in a professional venue that's registered with the uh, performance rights organizations, that also creates money for the artist and for the label or whomever owns the publishing, I should say, moreover, um, which she runs her own publishing. So they were tr they were effectively trying to stifle her in so many words, right? When she wanted to do collabs and features with people, they were not signing off on the paperwork or they were giving her resistance. She ended up having to literally get a restraining order on the label so that they could not use their power to veto her decision making, right? It's not a lot of artists that find themselves in that position at the height of their career like she did. And there's not a lot of artists that find themselves on the other side of that type of behavior or of that type of treatment to where they can actually progress and move forward with their career. So Rock Nation really helped her with a lot. They helped her with the legal team. We know how strong the legal team over there at Rock is. Those are Jay-Z's personal lawyers. Those are, you know what I mean? They have a, a staff of just fucking craziness. You know what I mean? So you may wonder what the benefit is of going to them. But if you look at her, you see all of the benefits. Now, everybody's not going to receive those benefits. I mean, she's a star artist, right? Um, somebody did send me a clip of her, her uh, serving the liquor while on the tour. Let me see if it's still in my inbox here. And if I can't pull it up in a timely fashion, I won't worry about it. But somebody definitely sent it to me recently. Yeah, here we go. So this ain't no big deal, but they had a um, a food truck promoting the album and the liquor, which I think is dope. Chicas Divertidas. I'll take a quick little screenshot of it and I'm going to put it up on the screen. And I'm sure y'all have seen it. She gets a lot of traction on her Instagram, but. We're going to show it just, just to show it. You feel me? So. Here we are. So this is Hot Girl Productions. That's that's her money. That's her putting the motherfucking, putting the capital up to make this happen. Got the truck is wrapped. You know what I'm saying? Got the logo. Got the album, Megan, new album available now. So that's dual promotion dual marketing at the same time and as she continues with her tour this thing is pulling up so you could bet your bottom dollar more people are going to continue to buy the album i know some people again are looking at that sixty-five thousand with disgust but just remember number one the tracking week is not over right that's sixty-five thousand, and we still got till friday so you can't really count her out she might get to 80, she might get to 90,000 by the end of the week. You get what I'm saying? And ha have a strong debut with 85 to 90,000. You just never know. Um, not to mention the forthcoming weeks, all of her projects are above platinum, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think this one is going to be anything below that, especially when, if you fuck around and look up July 2nd, 2025, and you see it's platinum or double platinum or some shit like that. Just don't be surprised. She's going to continue to work this music. I think they've got a plan in, in place. We still haven't got into the international dates. We still haven't seen if, the, if she's going to launch dates out in Japan, which I would expect to see, especially with the um, the Japanese influence on the album and collaborating with the artists and the anime samples and all that stuff. So that's going to be a whole nother component that's going to add and lend to the longevity of the album, regardless of what somebody like myself thinks of a record like Mamushi, which wasn't for me, but I understood the purpose and the significance of it, right? Now, getting into uh, Beyonce telling her, hey, girl, you need to have a motherfucking liquor brand because every time every time I see you, you're getting overly lit. You out here with the goddamn... <laughs> you out drinking this motherfucking Hennessy with a scrawl. You need to have your face on this motherfucker. Your name. Sure enough, I think that's dope as well, because there's one thing for Beyonce to tell you that and give you an idea and plant the seed. But when you have that suggestion 
and you're managed by Beyonce's husband's company. And you can actually go into a meeting and say, well, you know, Beyonce did say I need to have my own motherfucking liquor. And it's like, let's put that on the table. Let's ideate. Let's let's put this together and make sure we can make it happen. I'm not going to accept nothing less. This is what I, I really need to make this happen. And then they help you actually put the plan together in order to make it happen. Again, that's another testament to them working on her behalf. Now, there's some people out there that want to see Jay-Z go down. We haven't even seen no reasons for Jay-Z to go down. They just see the, the downfall of niggas like Kanye and Diddy and feel like he's too closely associated with them not to have no skeletons in his closet. But just understand, if Jay-Z goes down, his assets go down, his company goes down, that means that your beloved Megan Thee Stallion will also catch some windfall on that. So for anybody that's a hottie, y'all should be heavily invested in Jay-Z's freedom so that your girl can continue to thrive. Okay, that's all I'm going to say on that. Now, when it comes to Jay-Z and Rock helping people get out of bad situations, I'm going to derail the conversation for just a moment because the producer Hit Boy, who used to be signed to Kanye's good music at one point as a producer on the label, he came out and spoke about how Rock Nation got him out of a bad publishing deal. He had been stuck in a, in a in a in a predatory pub deal since he was about 17, 18 years old. He's now 37 and he finally now has an end date to where he can get out of that deal. So that means he's been in that motherfucker about 20 years. And this is the same hit boy that produced one of the biggest records of the past 15 years. Niggas in Paris. Not to mention countless others, songs for Beyonce, so many other people. He was 19 when he first got in that uh, publishing deal with Universal. He's 37 now, so he's been in that deal 18 years, and he was not making any royalties off of these big records. We could go down a fucking track, a fucking uh, track record of what he's done for people in the industry. And it's amazing that he's still able to take care of himself and work. So we're going to play him, and then we're going to get back into Megan, all right? So I just want y'all to understand how, how people's lives are being affected by these people. We don't always get to hear these stories. Time. Right. But people, like, I know you went right about, you went through that deal where you had a deal at the beginning that took a long time to get yeah, out of. Yeah, it's crazy because I'm actually still in my publishing situation. For how long? Your original when one? I signed when I was uh, 19 years old. You're still in your I'm original? 37, so y'all been in the deal for a long time. Yeah, oh. he's a copa with Universal wow. Publishing. And uh, Polo, and it's just the you know the way it was set up. It's just ancient terminology in the contracts, and I just now you know thanks to like Desiree and Jay Z and people like that that really like kind of got me to the place I'm in now where I can I have an end date. But before my whole career, I was working without having an actual end date to the way we really get our money, which is through publishing. You know what I mean? So I'm like you know just a little bit more out, and that's like that's gonna be like life-changing for me, you know what I mean? Just to even have freedom as a grown man, like, I haven't been able to go do other deals or go get advances in different places like my counterparts have, and just like, even, you know, not to, I, I eat very well, but it's like, I I know what it really is supposed sure. to be, you know what I mean? And it's just like, I'm still, that's gonna be the, the, the day. For sure. All right, so I do wanna point out, he's talking, when he said Polo, we're talking about producer Polo the Don. Polo the Don, and uh, Tricky Stewart um, and a couple other people have been responsible for fucking up the careers of songwriters and producers under these predatory contracts, these pub deals where they sign them as a producer or a writer under their company. They go put them in a, in a situation with Sony or Universal. And then those very same artists and writers, excuse me, writers and producers, um, when those songs start coming out, they don't see anything, right? Because I've told y'all, I told y'all before about this, uh, this clause called the MDRC. We don't got to spend too much time on it, but the MDRC basically gives you a minimum commitment where we'll just say 10 songs. They say, you got to put out 10 songs a year. You say, oh, I could do that fucking easily with my eyes closed. And then they start giving you all of these different provisions in the contract that will prohibit you from actually, um, counting as 10 songs, right? 
in a simple world, uh, you and an artist go in the studio, you make a song, you split that song 50-50, right? So that song under the MDRC clause is not a complete song for you. You have to get, you'll take that 50%, you'll apply it towards the next song. You get another song with 50%. Now that you've produced two songs, it's counted as one. But then they'll say, uh, you can't work with an independent artist. It has to be a major label artist, right? Then they'll say, oh, that's a major label artist, but did the song get released as a single? No, it don't count. Did that song hit the top 40? It didn't. It don't count. So it was all of these different things to where you're always working in the negative. It's the same way that record labels put you in a position where they give you $500,000, $300,000, a million dollars or more in some people's case. And your album finally comes out and you're like, oh, my God, we just did, you know, 500,000 copies. Clearly, I've recouped and they start showing you all of the paperwork and showing you all of the, nope, we've spent money here. We did the marketing promotion here. You went on tour. You went and did a press run. You went and did this. You went and did that. You're uh, $6 million in the hole. And every time you think you're making progress toward that number, they showing you reasons why you're not. So shout out to Rock Nation for not only helping Megan Thee Stallion get out of a predatory contract, but also helping Hit Boy to find an expiration date on his publishing contract, which means very soon he'll actually be able to start cashing in on the catalog of music that he's produced over the last 18 years, which is actually quite vast. He hasn't Hit Boy has been on every Beyonce album. We'll just say that. Well, not every Beyonce album, but the, every Beyonce album from like 2010 on up. Yeah. Anyway, back to Megan. Let's see here. Also in the interview, she addressed um, looking up to Lil Kim. So we're going to speak. We'll, we'll, we'll let her speak on that. Let me pull this piece up. But I'm, obviously, as a female rapper, we know the ones Lil Kim, Foxy Brown, Charlie Baltimore, all those ones that came before you. Uh, MC Light, Queen, Queen Latifah. Shout out Latifah. I just saw her the other day. So when you were, when you were growing up, what female rapper? Like was like, I like her. That's what I would like to. I'm not saying you want to be like that, yeah. but who did you listen to growing up? I'm gonna say this one more time. I used to want to be just like my mama. Really? Because my mama was a rapper, but my mama. What was her name? What was the name? Hollywood. But my mama's uh, favorite female rapper was Lil Kim. Okay. So she put me on Biggie before she put me on Lil Kim, and I used to love Biggie so much. I still love Biggie. But she was like, if you like Biggie, I got something for you that's gonna fuck you up. So then she started playing me Kim, and I was like. So I definitely was on Kim early, but definitely my mama was my favorite right. female rapper. Have you ever met Kim? Lil of Kim? course I've met Kim. Like, and you would think how much shit Lil Kim be talking with that deep ass voice on them fucking beats. She's six foot tall. You would think she finna be <laughs> tall as a motherfucker and just the voice finna be deep like that. I met Lil Kim and she was like, hey, what's up? I was like, Kim, Kim, Kimberly, where's the real Lil Kim? Cause this ain't Kim. She is so nice and she's so sweet and she gives just like baby girl energy. Like she is just so cute and petite and nice. And I was like, I cannot believe you are this sweet. Right. I love her. When you were growing up, Megan Houston. All right. So that's that's receiving that love from an OG. Um, they've linked up multiple times. You know what I'm saying? And then uh, there's actually a photo that I'm about to put on the screen of Megan Thee Stallion and Lil' Kim. Let me pull that up for y'all. And I'm also going to pull up a clip of Lil' Kim co-signing Lotto and Megan Thee Stallion back in 2020. You know? So she's been supporting for a long time. This is Megan and Lil' Kim. The hottie link up. You feel me? So let's get to the clip of Lil' Kim speaking about Lotto and Megan. And again, this is an interview that she did with Rob, Rob Markman and Genius from 2020, where she had high praise. Now, in this video, she primarily speaks about Lotto, how much she likes her. But toward the end, she gets into Megan. Lotto, 
she reminds, believe it or not, Mulatto, she she reminds me a lot of myself too. I love her. She talks slick. She talks very talks slick, Kim. She talks slick. <laughs> she talks slick, slick. And she talked like a nigga. Like she talked like a dude. She talked like a dude and I love that. So like Mulatto is like, and then I was watching one of her um, videos one time she put on her stories or something like that. And her personality really goes with her music. That's what I felt when I was watching her. And I'm like, Dad, she really in the street. You could tell she really in the street. And I, and I like that. Because I was really in the street. So I, I, I'm i identifying with her. But then right. Megan is really... But you know, like she came up... Her mom, you could tell her mom was really in the street doing what she right. do. So. And, and the lyrics, man, she on Savage, where she got her first number one single and got Beyonce on, 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 on the joint. She had the crazy line, I would never trip on them if I had them. Yeah. Bitch, that's my trash. You the maid, so you bagged them. Uh-huh. Like, the wordplay was kind of... All right. So that's Kim and Rob Markman, in which Lil' Kim praised Lotto, Megan Thee Stallion, and, he, and she gave a shout out to Megan's mom, saying she felt like she was real authentic, real thorough. She was really out in the street doing her do. And I ain't going to lie, hearing all this good talk, about Megan's mom as a rapper, I'm gonna have to do my due diligence to look in and see like if I could find some music from Megan's mom just to hear what she sounded like. Cause Megan spoke very highly of her in the interview. She talked about how she wanted to be like her mom, which I've already known and she's talked about at length throughout her career. But she talked about um, you know, how her mom really used to push her with her pen to where if she was rapping something and she felt like it wasn't good enough, Mama Dukes would say, <laughs> Do it again. Write it again. You ain't going hard enough. Fix it. You know? And perhaps that's what contributed to some of the early work that a lot of people are still in love with from Megan was her mom giving her not only inspiration, but also giving her that loving critique and that 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 extra push to be like, yeah, that's cool. That's that's dope what you did. But I know you could go harder. I know you could come harder. I know you could. That line you had, if you just rewrite that shit, you'll make it better. And unfortunately, she just doesn't have her mom here with her today. Rest in peace. So perhaps for anybody who feels like her pen may be slacking, I don't feel that way personally, but I've seen people have that critique. Um, maybe she's maybe she's missing that. And that's something that you can't replace. It is what it is, you know? But I feel like Personally, I feel like lyrically she's gotten better. But, you know, that's always up to preference and perception. Okay? That's that. Moving forward. Some other things that were addressed in the interview. She talked about Lotto. shit. <laughs> she talked about uh, ghostwriting. You know, uh, Shannon Sharp asked her about that. Asked her her thoughts on that. Has she received help in the booth? She says, nah, I write all my own shit as far as my verses. She says that she will take help on hooks, which is pretty standard. That's what most rappers have no problem uh, conceding to. That's something that's been around for years. Rappers go in the booth. They get in, you know what I mean? Go in the studio, link up with the producer. They got the vibes coming. They body in the verses. And then it's like, all right, what are we going to do for the hook? Then you might start asking the room, all right, what y'all, like, we got to make this shit catchy. We got to make this this hook as dope as possible. Put your thoughts on the table. Put your thoughts on the table. I'm going to come up with some shit. We try to put, you know what I mean? Maybe maybe we see who has the best idea for the hook, and we're going to go with that. Right? Even everybody's beloved Nicki Minaj, she talks about the same thing. She writes all of her verses, but she will take help from a hook. If a producer already has a hook in the beat and it's there, They'll keep it uh, or if she feels like it could be better. And I'm talking about, you know, just period. If Most artists, they feel if it could be better, we're going to change it. But input on hooks is not an indictment on an artist's craft. OK. Just want to be clear about some certain things. Um. And I think I actually have the clip where she spoke about it, but I'm just trying to get to it because I got so much shit saved. You feel me? All right. So here we have it. 
When my mom was alive, my mama and me used to go back and forth freestyling or she'll listen to something I wrote or something I recorded and she'd be like, you can say it harder than that. Or huh? you, yeah, she'll be like, you mom can, was like that. Mama was like, you could say it harder than that. You, or she'll, she'll say you ain't going hard enough. You need to go in there and do it again. So taking a suggestion from somebody, I feel like is cool. Yeah. Like everybody need a little inspiration. Mm -hmm. But me personally, like I like to write my own verses because it's very hard for me to say things that I did not write. It's very hard for me to believe what I'm saying if I ain't say it. Right. But I don't think nothing wrong with you getting help. Right. Cause I'ma take some help on the hook. Right. Cause I talk a lot, so I'm a I'm writing verses. Right. But when it gets to the hook, I feel like it, it got to be catchy, it got to be simple, it got to be straight to the point, and I'll be talking. So somebody gotta, I'll take your you, you advice. Take, you on take that. advice on that. Yeah, I'll take advice on that. Have you? I feel like. And following up on that, unfortunately, it cut off. But he also asked her about the prospect of her possibly writing for other artists. She was a little bit hesitant to answer. It felt like she wanted to say yes, but she said no. And then she went on to say, you know, I would like to write for other artists in the future, but she didn't admit to uh, coming up with any bars for anyone else. But again, if you see the interview yourself, you'll see that she kind of took some time to stew about how she wanted to answer that question. And personally, I feel like if the answer was a real 100 percent fact, no. She would have said that out the gate, like, nah, I ain't never wrote for nobody, but, you know, I would love to do that. I haven't had the opportunity to do so, but she took a minute to be like, how do I want to answer this fucking question? Because I don't want nobody even digging in, trying to find out where my DNA might be in somebody else's raps. So, no. But we'll see, though. You know what I mean? Um, anything else that I want to delve into about Megan's interview before we move on to other things. I think I've covered everything that I kind of set aside. Oh, uh, she also talked about her relationship with Cardi B, which I do want to make sure we cover, right? Because again, there's been so many different accounts and we know those accounts out there and we know those people are typically from, from the op side. And when I say the op, I'm talking about her ops because I have none. Um, that put out these stories about Megan Thee Stallion and Cardi B having some unspoken beef, like they're behind the scenes beefing or like they're, um, you know, when they see each other getting ready to put out a song or an album or a photo, even they say, you can look and see that the other comes and follows up. And it's kind of like a competition, a silent competition between them where they trying to outdo each other. I don't know that to be true, but I've heard about it. I've seen people talk about it. So I think it's always best and vital when, when we have the opportunity to hear Megan or Cardi speak about the other so those ideas and rumors can be laid to rest. I'm hungry as fuck. I ain't going to lie to y'all, man. I'm, I'm hungry as shit. You know who remind, I think your spirit of Cardi B. You and Cardi, y'all, 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 y'all spirits. I mean, y'all like really high energy. Yeah. And you know, you you. I mean, I, I mean, I just love you guys together. I love what's her. what's Cardi? What's Cardi like? She is so sweet. Um, she's very. What's the word I want to say? She's kind of shy to be Cardi B. Like really? you would think Cardi is like loud and she just don't give a fuck and she just boom. No, my girl is actually a little shy. And every time we see each other, she be acting like it's the first time she's seen me ever in life. And I be like, girl, I just saw you. Like, <laughs> turn up. So then we been like after we get around each other for like 20 more minutes, then she'll be at normal again. <laughs> Man, I'm looking at the song WAP. How did you How? What? I mean, I'm just I guess he was dribbling that basketball. And <laughs> well, that that happened during, I feel like, during COVID. COVID. So I recorded that in my living room at that time. When I got the beat, I was like, okay. I, oh, this is how we coming? Here we go. And I recorded two verses, and I was like, Cardi, please don't take off my other verse. Like, just please, let's go back and forth. And she listened to the whole thing. Because I don't even think she had heard the second verse at first. Right. And she was like, oh, shit. Okay. Well, we doing this. Did you know you had a monster on your hand? I didn't. I just knew I had a song with Cardi B, and I was so excited. Like, I was so happy because I had never met her before. And when they said, Megan, Cardi, once you get on this song, I was like, Cardi, want me to get on the song? What? So then we met and then I recorded my stuff and it was amazing. 
And you know, like people, that's a that's a saying now. You know that, right? What wings and pizza? Yeah, no way. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay, what wings and mean? pizza. Worship and praise. <laughs> that, that's what you lead with now. Oh my god. Uh, I mean, what was number one on the Billboard 100? Reached over a billion streams on Spotify. What was the top trending Google search in a calendar year? Do you know how many times people search Google? In a day, do you know how many people are in the world? And they trying to figure out what WAP is. Yeah, I was trying to figure out like, what is this. You know what it is. I know what it, I I didn't know, but I know what it is now. Okay. I said, okay. No, I'm so happy. That was like that is one of my favorite songs that I've ever done. I love her. I'm so glad she asked me to do that. One of my favorite songs to listen to. Too. Yeah. <laughs> Talk to him. All right. So that's Megan talking about doing. WAP with Cardi, not to mention that they have other records such as uh, Bongos. They got the Wannabe remix with Glorilla. Um, I expected to see Cardi make an appearance on the Megan album. And perhaps we do get that on a deluxe version. Hopefully she has a deluxe planned out. It'll be dope if she shows up on there. I still would love to see her get get that Jay-Z feature on there personally. I would love to see her get another Beyonce feature personally, especially as an independent artist doing things herself. And, you know, it's no guarantee that that's going to happen, but that's just what I would like to see. Speaking for myself. But I believe that's everything that I wanted to cover in the interview. Again, if you haven't seen it yet, just go to Shannon Sharp Club Shay Shay. It's on there for you. The interview's about an hour long. It's over 1.2 million views as of this recording. Probably going to keep going up from here. Now, we're going to move into Cardi B. And like I told y'all at the beginning, no, actually, let me see if there's anything else I want to cover about Megan before we get into Cardi. Because I do have an article here where she spoke to Rolling Stone. I'm glad I, I'm glad I thought of this shit. Um, where she called Victoria Monet her twin, which in the Shay Shay interview, she actually spoke about how um, the song came together with her and Victoria Monet and how they were in the studio and she liked to set the moods with the lights low and she's a mixologist, so she was putting together drinks and mixing and a whole nine. She could be a professional bartender from the way uh, Megan was talking about her. So she's got this... Uh, article here on Rolling Stone speaking about her and I just want to run through this and then we're going to get into Cardi all right so they say Megan Thee Stallion talks about her love for UGK working with Victoria Monet and confirms the two sexiest southern accents and a special new commentary for her latest album Megan the full track by track is only available to Amazon music subscribers but a couple of excerpts have been shared for songs like Paper Together Accent and Spin so if y'all are uh, Amazon Music subscribers, that means that she's got a video doing a commentary for every song on the album. And the only way that you can access it is if you're an Amazon Music subscriber. So all the hotties out there, if you want to get to these uh, track by track explanations and commentary from Megan herself about the album, you're going to have to sign up on Amazon Music, which is low key a really dope um platform it gets overlooked from by spotify apple music even title gets a lot more love than amazon music but i ain't gonna lie amazon music pays pretty decently i get way less streams on there and they pay out a little better than some of these motherfuckers too so if you want to get her some extra money on in our pockets you might want to listen to megan on there but they state Paper Together is one of the highlights from the album featuring Texas hip-hop legends UGK, complete with a posthumous unreleased verse from Pimp C. In the track-by-track, track, Meg reiterates her love for Pimp C, noting that her nickname, Young Tina Snow, is a nod to the late rapper's own nickname, Tony Snow. Bow! So, if you weren't into the lore of um, UGK like that, you would have never known that Pimp C's nickname was Tony Snow, and you would have never known that Tina Snow was actually inspired by him directly, right? She says, I'm a huge fan of Pimp, a huge fan of Bun B, and this feature means so much to me because I get to say that I have a song featuring UGK. But y'all know how iconic that is? Do y'all know how legendary that is? This shit right here means really means something to me, but I know it really means something to the South, right? And in the Shay Shay interview, she also talked about how much that meant to both her and 
Lil Jew Made the Beat, who's also a big fan of UGK. Elsewhere, Megan talks about working with Victoria Monet, her self-described twin, on Spin. Speaking on how the song came about, Megan recalls how Monet came into the studio wondering what they were going to work on. And Megan replied, you ain't leaving this goddamn studio until you give me a song. So she held her ass hostage and said, we're going to come out with something, goddamn. <laughs> we're not coming in here tonight just to hang out and have drinks. We're going to make some fucking music. Right. Furthermore, they state and that, as Megan notes, is what happened. She says we got in there and she was singing a little hard out and I was in there and I was like, dang, I got to come hard because I love the way she's singing. The vibe is great. The melody is great. And I just felt like it was long overdue. So when we made the song, it just came out beautifully. Another major collab collaboration, excuse me, on the album is Accent with Glorilla. She says, I feel like people with Southern accents, people just love it when we speak. They want to hear me say it again. I feel like people love to hear Glow talk. I definitely love her accent. I feel like Houston and Memphis accents. These are like the top two sexiest accents in the South. And then Dallas, then she says, I'm just playing. Everyone knows people have this uh, infatuation with New Orleans accents as well. But, you know, shout out to her and Glow. It's one of my favorite records from the album. I've said that. I will stand behind that statement. Okay. They also state... The Megan track by track also features Megan talking about Rattle and where them girls at. Again, the album dropped last Friday, June 28th, marking Megan Thee Stallion's third studio album following 2022's Trauma Zine and her official 2020 debut, Good News. Yeah. King of my city in Kodasak, coming out swinging like soldier rags, yeah. leading my people like quarterback, but I study this shit, I'm an almanac, yeah. had to get up and grind, knowledge is booming, I'm here to apply, came with the chip and the dip, it just single the mind, we finna do more to survive, I need my shit, yeah. spinning the block for the Gouda, we hitting the jeweler to flood out the net. We don't do beef on computers, so straight out the sewer, we come when you rest. Yeah. Niggas be looking perplexed, so keeping my foot on their neck. Uh -huh. No map, I trust my gut for the quest, but drama I'm fully abreast. Yeah. I was ready for years and they doubted me. Uh -huh. All of a sudden, they tell me they proud of me. Yeah. I been dropping these haters like calories. Uh -huh. Cross somebody came back with some batteries, stand for my honor. But you run no gunner, packing a stick with a drum. Wanna catch my bad one fumble, I done came too far to be humble.